So we've spent a bit of time now um, talking about different ways that plants will uh, limit their uh, any excess energy uh, from being absorbed and therefore causing oxidative damage, resulting in photoinhibition. Um, and so we move on to a couple of other um, res uh, adap basically adaptations in to prevent or limit photoinhibition um, for plants that are. Um, potentially exposed to high versus low light intensities. So adaptations in leaf morphology would be um, uh, the result of chronic um, light, excess light exposure. And so we look at the first um, type, or let's say we'll put these in letters, which would be uh, leaf orientation and how the leaf is oriented may increase or decrease the incoming light energy. So, for example, grasses have linear leaves uh, that are vertically oriented towards the sun. Um, and so that means there, the incoming radiation is, uh, there's going to be less incoming radiation actually impacting or in, uh, penetrating the surface of the leaf um, versus um, basically horizontally arranged broadleaf species, um, horizontally oriented leaves, which are going to maximize the incoming um, uh, energy, sunlight energy. So for example, we might see uh, more horizontally oriented uh, leaves in the understory vegetation uh, that are more shade tolerant. They may also have broader leaves and larger, wide, you know, more surface area in their leaves than the grasses. And so this is, the grasses here um, are going to be uh, more prevalent in the Great Plains and in other regions exposed to high light and um, uh, more uh, contrasting temperatures between summer and winter. And we'll talk more about these actually because we're going to talk about photosynthetic adaptations to those conditions eventually here. Another uh, physiologic or sorry, morphological adaptation might be leaf arrangement. And in this case, we have, if we look at the whole plant, we might see plants that have their leaves sort of um, oppositely arranged. So this is opposite leaf arrangement versus where the leaves are alternating around the stem. And so this is alternate leaf arrangement. And so the question is, which one of these is going to um, maximize incoming solar radiation and which one is going to be more limiting? Um, and so opposite arrangement reduces or limits um, the amount of light energy being absorbed because there's more shading, self-shading from within the plant. Another um, sort of morphological adaptation is the presence of hairs or trichomes. Oops, let's misspell that there. Um, leaves that are uh, pubescent is another way of describing them. And the hairs can, can reflect the incoming solar radiation, thereby reducing the amount that gets absorbed. So pubescence or hairs can increase um, radiation, reflection of solar radiation. Um, and we see this in things like cacti and other um, desert or Mediterranean species. Um, say, uh, sage uh, is one. Um, and others that, in fact, the atroplex that we talked about with regard, if, if we've talked about this in the paper that was uh, on halophytes and uh, water potentials, have um, an abundance of trichomes or hairs. And then, in some cases, nictinastic movements can allow plants to either um, absorb more light radiation or to limit light. Um, radiation absorption. 
Uh, in that case, the plant or the leaves are moving either toward the light or away from the light. So uh, there are certain legume species that do this, oxalis, uh, oxalis and mimosa, which is called sensitive plant also, are examples, I may have the spelling of this wrong, but are examples of plants that will move toward light or respond to touch. Um, and then there are species that will limit their incoming solar radiation by closing up too. So now that we've talked about a lot of different ways that plants can um, uh, modify the incoming solar radiation, uh, we, we have plants that are actually exposed to different levels of solar radiation. Um, and so we have, uh, just as an, as an application of some of this, this, these topics, we have high light versus um, low light adapted plants that we can kind of apply some of these topics that we've been talking about with regard to the photosynthetic light curves and photo inhibition. And so if we were to take a look at a uh, light curve here um, associated with a high light versus a low light adapted plant, remember we have a radiance. We should be able to um, draw these graphs and as well as interpret them. So a radiance, which is measured as micromoles per meter square per second, um, for photosynthetically active radiation versus photosynthesis rate. And in this case, most of the time when we're discussing this, we're talking about CO2 consumption rate, which again is in oops, micromoles per meter square per second. Okay, and here's that. So let's say we're looking at a high light adapted plant. Um, or versus a low light adapted plant. And so we're going to draw two curves. And one is shown here, supposed to be sort of evening out there, which we're going to call plant A. Um, and then we're going to show another plant here that has sort of a steeper initial curve, but then a lower uh, curve, part of the curve right here. And there's B. So the question is, um, which curve, light curve, represents a, a high light adapted plant? Oops. Versus a low, a set, let's say a shade adapted. Plant, maybe an underst understory plant. Well, if we compare the two, uh, high light adapted versus low light adapted, uh, with regard to photosynthetic efficiency and photosynthetic capacity, which are reflected in these, this um, photosynthesis, uh, pho photosynthetic light response curve, um, a high light adapted plant uh, is able to maximize photosynthetic capacity because it has plenty of light to um, develop machinery and so forth. Um, so it's um, at maximizing the amount of uh, carbon that it can fix at the expense of uh, photosynthetic efficiency. So it tends to have lower photosynthetic efficiency as a result. Whereas a low light adapted plant is going to need to maximize its photosynthetic efficiency in order to take advantage of as much light as possible, as much light energy as possible, and as a result, um, it sacrifices uh, photosynthetic capacity. So the question is, which of these two curves um, is um, described by these two, these two um, different kinds of uh, adapted light adapted plants? Well, remember that this part of the curve is um, photosynthetic efficiency and reflects light limitation and this part of the curve up here reflects photosynthetic capacity and reflects light saturation um, but then uh, carbon limitation or carbon, carbon um, fixation limitation. So the high light adapted plant tends to be the plant showing um, on curve A and the low light adapted plant tends to be the one, is the one that's shown in curve B. 
Um, so Curve B light, low light adapted plant is going to have um, this high rate. This is supposed to be a steeper slope than um, in A. So a steeper or a high, it's, this is a little right this down, steeper slope tends to have higher photosynthetic efficiency, but then sort of gets becomes limited by its carbon fixing uh, machinery. Uh, you also might note here the difference in the light compensation points, such that the, the low light adapted plant can take advantage of as low light uh, as possible here, um, given its con consistent or um, long-term exposure to low light. So low light adapted plants have a lower light compensation point than high light adapted plants. And with that, low light adapted plants tend to have a higher concentration in chlorophyll in order to take advantage of as much light energy as possible. So the question we might then ask with regard to photo inhibition is which of these plants is more vulnerable to photo inhibition? Uh, okay, so we'll jot down that question. Is more vulnerable so one of the things to um, to to realize when we're talking about um, the photosynthetic capacity of each of the or photosynthetic efficiency rather of each of these um, the plant that's under high light exposure has to come up with all these different ways, these mechanisms that we've been talking about, to prevent photo inhibition on a chronic basis. So it has lower photosynthetic efficiency because it has uh, more limited pigments and so forth to, to absorb light energy, so uh, more mechanisms to dissipate that excess energy. Whereas the low light adapted plant um, has more chlorophyll and more light harvesting complex uh, a greater quantity there to absorb as much light energy as possible. So a high light adapted plant is going to already have the the um, the, the capacity or the uh, the modifications adaptations to limit incoming light energy, and so it's going to be less um, vulnerable to photo inhibition. Whereas the the low light adapted plant. Um, is less able to uh, withstand that stress because it's uh, it's not already adapted to high light, and so it already has you know more pigment than uh, and less um, uh, mechanisms to deal with photo inhibition than because uh, it's because of its chronically low light level, uh, and so when it's suddenly exposed, such as in a gap um, that forms in the forest, it very quickly does um, encounter photo inhibition. So perhaps it has uh, less response to um, um, to downregulate the synthesis of the light harvesting complex compared to the high light adapted um, plant. Now, one thing that the discussion of photo inhibition um, uh, leads to is the understanding that photosy photosystem two and photosystem one are tightly coupled. So we we refer to that as coupling. Um, and we kind of referenced that initially here when we were talking about um, how the protein kinase here in the thylakoid membranes uh, sense the level of redox to oxidized form of plastiquinone, uh, and then that uh, ratio then triggers light harvesting complex to dissociate in order to allow photosystem 1 to catch up with the um, activity of photosystem 2. And so that leads us to um, a discussion which we have in class in looking at uh, exposures to single light intensities, 650 uh, to 680 versus 700 nanometers of light uh, wavelengths, um, and how that affects photosystem 2 versus photosystem 1 activity, and also with the introduction of herbicides and where they interrupt the flow of the electron transport chain. So that's an activity that we encounter in class, and um, so make sure you review that activity.